for any web developer or programmer. What does a HTML file contain? A HTML file contains a document type declaration, a head, a body, and elements. Elements are comprised of opening and closing tags. What are tags and elements? As you can see, we have an opening div tag, and here's a closing div tag. The opening and closing div tags create an element. In particular, this is a logical division. What is HTML5? HTML5 is the latest version of HTML. It is still a work in progress. However, most modern web browsers do support HTML5. This includes Opera, Firefox, Chrome, and Safari. So why do we use HTML5? HTML5 introduces a lot of semantic elements. The word semantics comes from ancient Greek, referring to a study of meaning. So when we say semantic elements, we refer to elements with meaning. HTML5 is also a cleaner way to write HTML. And it is a part of modern web development. Some examples of some semantic elements include the header element, the nav element, and the footer element. As you can tell just by the name of these elements, you have a rough idea on what that element should actually contain. Some examples of some non-semantic elements include the div element, as you saw earlier, the logical division, and the span element. I hope you've learned a little bit about the fundamentals of HTML and HTML5. In this video, we're going to give you a brief overview of HTML5. Hypertext markup language, otherwise referred to as HTML, played a real vital role in making the web a better place to hang out. Imagine if the web looked dull. Who'd want to stay around in front of our screens all day long? Who would enjoy browsing websites, listening, and viewing videos? No one. So with the fast advancement of technology, the demand for a better coding experience in creating web pages has pushed HTML to its limit. And thus, a better version was created in the new standard of HTML5. There's a lot of great new things that HTML5 supports, like new elements, new attributes, full CSS3 support, video and audio, 2D and 3D graphics, local storage, local SQL databases, and web applications. So the ability to support audio and video is also new in HTML5, making it easier for developers to add video and audio using the tags video and audio. Another good thing about the audio and video selectors is that it's supported in all major browsers. With HTML5, drawing graphics is simplified with the new elements like the canvas selector, inline SVG, and the use of CSS3 2D and 3D transforms. Web and mobile development is so much easier with HTML5. Here are some of the features added that make the whole development process easier. Local data storage, which allows a web page to store information locally within the client browser, similar to how cookies were used in previous versions. Also, local file access. The use of local SQL databases. Application caching that allows a web application to be accessible without an internet connection. And finally, HTML5 web workers that allow JavaScript to run in the background without affecting the performance of the page. Ideally, semantic elements should describe their purpose clearly, making it easier for developers to understand. However, there are tags that don't have any meaning like the div tag. So we would commonly use IDs or declare class names such as div class equals header to the div tags to give meaning to it. But now in HTML5, new semantic elements were released to convey clearly the purpose of those elements. Here are a few examples of the new elements in HTML5. Header for the header, footer for the footer, section for wrapping content in a section, nav for menu navigation, 
article for placing your main content, and a side for creating left and right sidebars. Along with these new elements, there are also new form elements, new attributes, new input types, and automatic validation. With the new HTML5 combined with CSS3, creating some cool effects is much easier with these new elements. New selectors, new properties, animations, 2D and 3D transformations, rounded corners, shadow effects, downloadable fonts, and much, much more. So there you go. I gave you a brief overview on what's new in HTML5. There's a whole lot more of the new stuff in HTML5 to cover. So in our next video, we'll walk through all the new elements in HTML5. See you there. To start developing in HTML5, we'll need a browser that actually supports HTML5. So let's go ahead and download Google's Chrome browser. You can find this at google.com forward slash chrome. Once the page is loaded, you can go ahead and click download chrome to download chrome for your specific system. Once the download is complete, you can go ahead and install Google's Chrome just like any other piece of software. To start developing in HTML, we'll need a text editor. So let's go ahead and get Komodo Edit. You can find this at activestate.com forward slash Komodo edit. Once the page is loaded, we'll go ahead and click download now. This will take us to the download page. Then you can select the download Komodo edit to download the latest package for your specific system. Once you've downloaded Komodo edit, you can go ahead and install it just like any other piece of software. Now that we have Komodo edit downloaded and installed, we can go ahead and open it and set up our development environment. Once Komodo Edit loads, you'll be greeted with this start page. We'll be working with this left panel. So for the first time when you load this up, you'll probably see something like this. So what we want to do is select the desktop, right click on it, and select make this folder root. This will allow us to directly work in the desktop. If you're not actually seeing this left panel, go ahead and toggle this view with this button right here. Alternatively, you can head over to view, tabs and sidebars and select places. This will also open up this left sidebar. So once we're inside the desktop directory, we can go ahead and right click, select a new folder, and create a new folder in which we'll be working in. I'm gonna title this HTML. So let's create our first HTML file. Let's open up Komodo Edit, and navigate to the HTML directory we created earlier. Right click on it and select new file. Here we'll be prompted to enter in the new file name. I'm going to call this structure.html. Notice that most HTML files actually require the .html file extension. So now we can double click on structure.html to open it inside our text editor. Now to start working with HTML, we have something called the HTML document structure. So we start this off with the doc type. The doc type for HTML5 is just doc type HTML. Also notice the exclamation mark at the start of this syntax. The document type for earlier versions of HTML including HTML 4.01 and XHTML, required quite a large document type. It was actually kind of confusing for new developers. In HTML5, 
the document type is actually just HTML. Doc type HTML. This is part of the beauty of HTML5 and its simplicity. So now we go ahead and create our opening and closing HTML tags. This will contain our head section and body section of our HTML. Then we create our head and inside the head we put a title. This will be the title of our web page. This doesn't have to be the same as the actual HTML file name. But I'm going to go ahead and stick with the naming convention we have and call it structure. Then we have our body. Inside the body is where we put content that we would actually want rendered in the browser. In the head, we put things such as internal and external scripts and style sheets meta tags, and the title. As you've noticed, when I've typed this out, Komodo Edit has actually indented certain elements. This is a part of good coding practice. It allows us to easily navigate our HTML and read it efficiently. So as you'll notice, this head section is inside our HTML so therefore we have indented the head section one tab space. And as the title is inside the head section, we've indented that one additional tab space. So when we start to add content in our body, we'll actually start one tab space in. This is a part of good coding practice and will help you become efficient with writing HTML. So now that we have our HTML5 document structure, let's take a look at it in the browser. So go ahead and save this. Click on the little arrow on this preview button. And from the drop down menu, select Google Chrome to open it up in our Google Chrome browser and select preview. This is our HTML5 document structure loaded up in the web browser. And as you can see, there's absolutely nothing on this page. It's a blank canvas. So let's take a look at outputting some text to the browser. Just type in hello world. Go ahead and save this again and open it up in our browser once again. As you can see, we have the Hello World text output to the browser. I hope you've learned a little bit about the HTML5 document structure and how to actually output text to the browser. In this video, we're going to take a quick look at something called the DOM. The DOM is the document object model, and it's basically a structured representation of the document that's actually loaded in the browser. So to demonstrate this, let's just type in some plain old text, Hello World. And now that we have that, let's go ahead and save our file, then take a look in the browser. As you would have expected, we just have our simple Hello World text. But what we can do is we can actually right click in the browser window and select Inspect Element. And this will bring up something called Google Chrome's Developer Tools. And here we have the Elements panel selected by default. Under the Elements panel, this is basically the DOM, the Document Object Model. Here we have a structured representation of the document that's actually loaded into the browser. When we start to get into JavaScript and other scripting languages, we can actually manipulate the content or manipulate these elements inside the DOM. So it's important to note that this structured representation of the document that is loaded in the browser is actually very different to the actual source. In this case, we won't see any difference between what is loaded up in the elements panel and the actual source. But as you start to work with scripting languages and start manipulating the DOM, we will actually have a vast difference between the actual source code and what is contained within the document object model. So to give you a brief 
overview of what I'm talking about, we can actually right click and go view page source as well. And this will always be exactly what we've typed into our HTML file. So always remember that the actual source code can be different or can differ from the actual DOM, the structured representation of the document that is loaded in the browser. If you're wondering why my text editor looks a little bit different to yours, it's because I've set up a custom appearance. You can easily do this by going to the Preferences menu and selecting Fonts and Colors. You can go ahead and select a predefined color scheme and make a few changes to make it your own. You can start off by changing the font size to something a little bit easier to read. And then you'll be prompted to enter in a new scheme name. I'm just going to call this Custom 5 as I have a few custom appearances already set up. Then you can head over to the Language Specific tab and make sure you've got HTML5 selected. Also make sure the element type selection is set to tags. So then we can change the color of the actual HTML tags. So by selecting the foreground color picker, we can actually change the color of these tags in the editor. You can also make a few other changes if you like. So now that we have our new custom appearance set up, go ahead and click OK and the settings will be applied. If you've been wondering why my tags have been closing themselves, and by that I mean if I type the opening tag, the closing tag will be automatically created for me. This is a feature of this coding environment, Komodo Edit. It is important to be able to type out the opening and closing tags manually to help you get a grasp of HTML. But as you progress and become fluent in HTML, you might find the need to use this autocomplete feature. So we can go over and turn this off by selecting Preferences, Code Intelligence, and down the bottom, automatically insert end tag when typing start tag in HTML and XML documents. We go ahead and turn that off and select OK. Come back in and start typing the div tag and close it. You'll notice that the closing tag has not been provided. We manually type this in and that is a part of good coding practice so I do recommend that you manually type in your opening and closing tags. In this video we're going to talk about validation and validating our HTML files. So to start off let's create a new HTML file and call this valid.html double clicking on it and now we're going to go ahead and type out our document structure which is doc type HTML our opening and closing HTML tags our head opening and closing tags our title we're going to give this a title of valid HTML and then we have our body so now that we have our structure Let's just add some simple text to the body of our HTML file. So it's going to save this, open it in our browser, and notice that it's just some text output to the browser as you would expect. So now what we're going to do is we're going to head over to validator.w3.org. This is the W3C Markup Validation Service. The W3C stands for the World Wide Web Consortium. And they lay out the standards of web-based technologies. It is important 
to validate our HTML files so that they may be displayed consistently among different browsers and different platforms. So let's start off by using the validate by direct input feature. So we'll go ahead and select our HTML contents, copy these, Command-C on the Macintosh and Control-C on Windows, and go ahead and just paste this in to the text area provided. Command-V on the Macintosh and Control-V on Windows. And we're just going to go ahead and click Check. This will attempt to run our HTML through the validator. As you can see, this document was successfully checked as HTML5, and that is exactly what we want. However, we should pay attention to these three warnings. Our result is passed with three warnings. So let's check out these three warnings and see what they are. So the first warning is using experimental feature HTML5 conformance checker. This is basically saying that while HTML5 is still a work in progress and is not set in stone, this validator for HTML5 may be slightly unreliable and maybe not up to date. So while HTML5 is not set in stone, we will always have this warning. But that's okay. So now moving on to the bottom two warnings. No character encoding declared at document level and using direct input mode UTF-8 character encoding assumed. Now it looks like these two warnings are relating to the same thing. Something about character encoding. So let's head back over to our HTML document and let's add some character encoding. We'll be using the character set UTF-8. By setting the character set of our HTML file, this will guarantee that we won't have any invalid characters rendering in the browser. So let's go ahead and add our character set. We can do this with the meta tag. Meta char set equals opening and closing double quotes UTF hyphen A. And then close it just like that. We've just added the character set to our HTML file. Go ahead and save this and take a look in the browser and see if it's made any real changes to our text that is being output to the browser. As you can see, it is exactly as it was before. It has not made any changes. So let's run this through the validator once more, but this time let's use the file upload facility rather than the direct input facility. Validate by file upload, choose file, and we will upload our valid.html file and click check. This document was successfully checked as HTML5, passed one warning. Let's take a look at what this one warning is, and it is the using experimental feature HTML5 conformance checker. And as I mentioned earlier, this is okay. We can't do anything about this and it will be there until HTML5 is set in stone. So by declaring our character set, i.e. our character encoding, and using the file upload facility rather than the direct input facility, we're able to remove those bottom two warnings and have our HTML5 validate successfully. I hope you've learned a little bit about who the W3C is, why we validate our HTML files, and why we declare our character set or our character encoding. Comments are used throughout all programming languages and web development technologies, including HTML. Comments allow us to communicate with other developers that may be working on the same project and explain why we have done certain things or even added certain content. We can also use comments to leave ourselves a note to help us remember what our intentions were with the HTML file or code. 
So let's take a look at creating a comment in HTML. So let's create a new HTML file. And we'll call this comments.html. Double click on it and create our document structure. Doc type, HTML, our opening and closing HTML tags, our opening and closing head, the title, we'll call this comments in HTML. And don't forget our meta tag, declaring our character set or our character encoding. UTF-8 and then our body. So a comment in HTML looks exactly like this. The less than sign, an exclamation mark, followed by two hyphens. Now we can actually write the contents of our comment. To close the comment, we use two hyphens and the greater than sign, simply like that. I'm just gonna put some text above this comment Now I'm going to go ahead and save this and preview it in our Google Chrome browser. As you can see, this is text has been rendered in the browser. Whereas our comment, this is a comment in HTML, has not. So I hope you've learned a bit about why we use comments and how to use them in HTML. In this video, we're going to start to talk about block level elements in HTML. Basically, what a block level element does is any content directly following the block level element will be rendered on a new line. So let's take a look at this in some code. Let's create a new HTML file, title this block.html. Double click on it to open it in our text editor and type out our HTML5 document structure. Our meta tag, the char set, our character encoding, UTF-8, our title, and we're going to give this a title of block level in HTML5. Go ahead and make sure this is properly indented. The title tag should be in line with our meta tag as they are both inside the head section. And then our body. Right, so now we have our HTML5 document structure. We can create some block level elements. The most common block level element is a logical division. Denoted by the opening and closing div tags. This creates a div element or a logical division. Logical divisions are used commonly in HTML as they allow us to break up our HTML document into different sections and segments. So this is a logical division. What I'm going to do is put some text directly following the logical division or block level element so we can take a look at what the block level element actually does in our browser. I'm going to go ahead and save this and preview it in our browser. As you can see, we have two lines of text. So this is a logical division, is inside the logical division. This text directly after the logical division on the same line is directly following the logical division. So as you can see, the content following the logical division will be rendered on a new line. 
So let's take a look at what happens if we put some text before the logical division. Save this, preview in our browser, and as you can see, the text entered in before the block level element is rendered on one line, the block level element is rendered on a new line, and the text after the block level element is also rendered on a new line. So that's basically what block level elements do by nature. So let's take a look at some other block level elements. We have the paragraph element, denoted by the opening and closing P tags. We also have a horizontal rule, which looks exactly like that. It looks a little bit different to the other elements or tags that we've seen recently, as this doesn't have its own closing tag. In earlier versions of HTML, we would have had to have done something like this. But as of HTML5, this is a valid horizontal rule. We also have lists. We have two kinds of lists in HTML, an ordered list and an unordered list. An ordered list is denoted by the OL opening and closing tags. Inside a list, we have things called list items denoted by the LI opening and closing tags. So let's save this and take a look in our browser and see how this order list renders in the browser. As you can see, we have a paragraph, which is just some standard text, followed by a horizontal rule, which is actually spanning the width of the page. And now we have our ordered list. As you can see, the list items inside the ordered list are listed by numeric values. Let's take a look at the other kind of list in HTML. The unordered list, denoted by the UL opening and closing tags. And just like the ordered list, the unordered list also has list items. So let's save this and take a look in our browser. As you can see, the unordered list is listed by dot points or bullets if you like. In HTML, we also have things called headings. These are denoted by the letter H and then a numeric value between one and six opening and closing tags. So we could have a H1, a H2, a H3, 4, 5 or H6 opening and closing tag creating a heading. So let's create the six different kinds of headings. A level 2 heading a level 3 heading Level 4, Level 5, and finally Level 6. Let's go ahead and save this and preview it in our browser. As you can see, we have quite an array of headings. 
ranging in size from a level 1 heading all the way down to a level 6 heading. They all have their uses, so a level 1 heading would be useful for something like an absolute page heading, and maybe a level 2 heading would be good for something like a subheading. These are all block level elements, so they all do the same thing by nature, as I explained with the logical division. So I hope you've learned a little bit about block level elements in HTML5. In HTML, there is an inline element called the line break. It's kind of like the horizontal rule in the way that it doesn't have a closing tag. As the name suggests, the line break is used to create a new line. Let's save this, preview it in our browser, and there you go. That's exactly what a line break does. Creates a new line. So we have two lines of text. So now in HTML, some people like to overuse the line break. We can get almost the same output by using the paragraph tags creating a paragraph element. So let's save this and take a look in the browser. As you can see, we have relatively the same output but the paragraph element has quite some spacing in there compared to the line break, which just creates a new line. But when working with text, the paragraph element is the preferred method. And as you can see, this looks much nicer than this. So another thing I want to talk about is actual spacing that gets rendered in the browser. So I'll demonstrate this by creating a new paragraph element. As you can see, in here I've added a few extra spaces. So let's see what the browser does for these extra spaces. So save it and preview it in our browser. So this is where we put the additional spacing, but as you can see, the browser only renders this as one single space. So let's try the same thing, but this time using the enter key. Save it and preview it in our browser. As you can see, exactly the same thing. Only one space is recognized in the browser. However, we can use the HTML entity for non-breaking space. This allows us to add in additional spacing where needed. So I'll show you this in action. Use the ampersand NBSP semicolon. That's the non-breaking space HTML entity. And that lets us add an extra space into our HTML. So what we can do is we can copy that and paste it several times to create a greater space in between words. 
So let's save this and take a look in the browser. As you can see, now we have the additional spacing. I hope you've learned a little bit about the inline break element and spacing in HTML. So let's talk about inline elements. Inline elements are quite different to the block level elements group as inline elements do not necessarily affect the surrounding content in the same way that the block level elements do. So let's start off by looking at the span element, denoted by the opening and closing span tags. And I'm going to add some text after the span element. Save this and preview in our browser. Have a think about what the browser might render. As these are inline elements, they are essentially in line with the content that is not a block level element. So by that I mean we have an inline element and then we have some text after the inline element. And as you can see, they are rendered both on the same line. So now let's talk about text modifiers. Put in a line break. This is one of those times where a line break is actually handy. And we're going to start off with the strong element. So in HTML, we can define the important text using the opening and closing strong tags. We can also use the emphasis element to render text with emphasis. So I'll go ahead and save this open it up in our browser and as you'll see this is some strong text which would be inside the strong element is being rendered as bold text and this is some text with emphasis which would be inside the emphasis element and it is being rendered with italic text so I hope you've learned a little bit about text modifiers and inline elements in HTML. The anchor element in HTML allows us to link to other web pages or websites. So as you can see, I've created a few HTML files and a couple of extra directories. So we have a home directory and also a content directory that is inside our HTML directory. The anchor element is denoted by the opening and closing A tags. This will render useless until we pass in the href attribute. The href stands for hypertext reference. It is in here that we pass in either a relative or an absolute file path or URL. So let's take a look at an absolute URL linking to Google's homepage. HTTP colon forward slash forward slash google.com. Now in between the opening and closing A tags, we put in some text that will make up the link. So let's save this and take a look in the browser. So if we go and click on this go to Google's homepage link, it'll take us to Google's homepage. Now what if we want the user to actually stay on our page when they click on this link? Well we can get this link to open up in a new page using the target attribute. 
and then we can pass in a value of underscore blank. Save this and take a look in our browser. Now when we click on this link, it will open in a brand new window, so the user is still actually on our web page. So now let's take a look at using some relative file paths or URLs for the href attribute. So I'm going to go ahead and create two different anchor elements. Copy and paste that. Now, for the first one, we're going to link to the home directory, the index.html file in the home directory. And the second one, we're going to link to the content directory. Right, so to go to the home directory, we actually need to get out of this HTML directory. We're currently in this index.html file, and we are in the HTML directory. So what we want to do is get out of the HTML directory and then go into the home directory, and then reference the HTML file that we want to use inside the home directory. So to do this, use two full stops, a forward slash, and then we can locate the home directory and then reference the HTML file that we want to link to. So this is essentially saying, get out of the HTML directory, go into the home directory, and then load up the index.html file. If we want to link to the content directory, which is inside our HTML directory, our current directory, we can just use the folder name or the directory name. So let's go into our other HTML files and link to the other two HTML files. So now we're in the home directory, we want to create two new anchor elements. We want this first one to go to the HTML directory We want this one to go inside the content directory. So to get back into the HTML directory, we simply go back one, because as you'll notice, we're inside the home directory. So we want to get out of the home directory. We want to go into the HTML directory. So we'll type in HTML, then we can reference the file name once we're in the HTML directory. To go to the content directory, we first need to get out of the home directory. So we go back one directory, go into the HTML directory, then into the content directory, and then we can reference the file name. So now let's add these two anchor elements to our index file inside the content directory. So right, to go to the home directory, this time we need to go back twice. We need to get out of the content directory, then we need to get out of the HTML directory, then we can go inside the home directory, and then use the file name that we want to link to. And to go to the HTML directory from our content directory, all we need to do is go back one directory, so we're in the HTML directory, then use the file name that we're linking to. Just like that. Let's go ahead and save all three of these files and preview it in our browser. Now 
as you can see now we have a couple of options. Go to the home directory or go to the content directory. So let's try out the home directory. You are now in the home directory. So now let's go back to the HTML directory. You are now in the HTML directory. Let's try out the content directory. You are now in the content directory inside the HTML directory. Let's go to the home directory from the content directory. You are now in the home directory. So you get the picture. We can link to local HTML files using relative file paths or URLs. So as you may have noticed, when I typed in the absolute file path for Google's homepage, I actually had to pass in the protocol. By protocol, I mean HTTP. HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. That essentially lets the browser know that we want to visit an external page. If I went ahead and just typed in www.google.com, go ahead and save this, and we'll try it out in the browser, and we'll see what happens. you notice that when we click on the Go to Google link, it will actually be trying to locate a directory or file titled www.google.com. So what we actually need to do is pass in the protocol, HTTP colon forward slash forward slash. As you may have seen, there's also a HTTPS. And whether you're using HTTP or needing to use HTTPS to link to an external web page, it's actually determined by the web page that you are linking to. So go ahead and save this, preview in our browser, and now we'll see that this will go to Google's homepage. When dealing with anchor elements, another important attribute is the title. In here, we can enter in content, so when the user hovers over our link, a little bubble will pop up and actually render the content that we've entered in into the title attribute. So let's save this and take a look at what the title attribute does to our anchor tag or anchor element. As you can see, when I hover over Go to Google, we get this little bubble popping up saying visit Google's homepage. That's essentially what the title attribute allows us to do. This is actually good practice as it will allow the user to learn more about the link that they will be visiting or why they should actually click on it in the first place. I hope you've learned a little bit about the basic directory structure when working with websites, using the anchor element to link to relative and absolute file paths, opening a web page in a new window, and using the title attribute of the anchor element. In this video, we're going to create an easy way for our viewers or readers to navigate back to the top of the page after they've read quite a sum of text. This is quite handy and it is used frequently in websites. Maybe on a website you've seen a link saying go to the top of the page or top. You click on it and you are sent to the top of the page. That's essentially what we will be doing. So to get started let's open Komodo Edit. And create a new HTML file. Title this page hyphen anchor. Double click on it to open it in the text editor. So let's start out by typing in our HTML5 document structure. Right, so now we have our HTML5 document structure. Let's create a heading. So using a level two heading. This is the top of the page. And at the very bottom of the page, we're gonna have an anchor element. Go to the top 
of the page. So what we need to do to be able to reference the top of the page or this level two heading, which we'll be using as the top of the page, we need to add in an ID. So ID equals opening and closing quotes. And inside the opening and closing quotes, we can ID this anything we would like. So I'm going to just name this top. So our level two heading now has an ID of top. We can reference this element with an ID of top using the hash symbol followed by the ID name. So this is essentially saying an ID of top. So when we click on this link, we'll be sent to an element with an ID of top. So now we need to generate some text. So we're going to head over to lipsum.com. That's lipsum.com. And this is the home of Lorem Ipsum. And that's pretty much the go-to dummy text of the web. It's very handy to use for such things as placeholders when you're working with a web page and you need some placeholder text. So I've just generated 10 paragraphs of lorem ipsum. So then we can go ahead and highlight it, then copy it, and head back over to our environment. And in here, I'm just going to paste in all of that text. Just make sure we indent our text as per good coding practices and for easy readability. Right, I'm also going to put in a line break down the bottom just to separate this, this anchor element from the body of this text. So let's go ahead and save this and open it up in our browser and check out what we've done. As you can see, we have a normal level two heading. Then as you scroll down, we see a lot of text. And as a convenience to our readers or viewers, we don't really want them to have to scroll all the way back up when they've finished reading our text. So this is essentially what this little link will do right here. So go ahead and click on your link and you'll be sent to the top of the page. More specifically, you'll be sent to the element with an ID of top. And that's an easy and effective way to link your users to the top of the page so they don't have to scroll through a sum of text. In HTML, using images is very important. We use the image element to render images on a web page. And this is what the image element looks like in HTML5. In previous versions of HTML, we would have had to have done something like this. But as we're working with HTML5, we just need this. And there's no closing tag to this image element. So to actually define an image in HTML5, we use the image element, and then we need to use the source attribute. And the source attribute will take a relative or an absolute file path or URL, just like the anchor elements href attribute. We're just gonna be looking at using a relative file path or URL to render an image on a web page. So as you can see, I've already procured a guinea-pig.jpg image, which is a image of a guinea pig. And the URL is here if you would like to go and download that image and use that yourself. So as the image is in the same directory as our current HTML file, we just use the file name like this. And that'll render our guinea pig image. So let's take a look in the browser. Save this and preview. As you can see, we have quite a large 
image of a guinea pig displayed in the browser. So what if we want to actually change the size of that image? We can do that using the width and height attributes. The width and height attributes take values in the form of pixels. So for the width, I'm just going to write 300, which will mean 300 pixels. And for the height, I'm going to give it a height of 350, which will be 350 pixels. So let's save this and take another look in the browser. As you can see, we're able to manipulate the size of the image using the width and height attributes of the image element. So an important thing to note when working with images in HTML is the alt attribute. This refers to alternate text. And we can put in text here that will render in the case that the image itself cannot be rendered. A good example of this is Google search engine. As search engines can't necessarily read images, they rely on the alternate text provided to actually index that image properly and the web page that contains it. So it's good to be as descriptive as possible when using the alt attribute. So let's save this and take a look in the browser again. As you can see, nothing has actually changed. We've still got our image there. But in the case that our image was not able to be displayed, we would have our alternate text displayed instead. So now let's put our image inside another directory and try rendering an image inside another directory. Put this images directory inside the HTML directory, then move the image inside the images directory. So now that our image is actually inside another directory, just like we would with the href attribute of the anchor element, we can just change the file path or the URL to actually locate the images directory and then the image inside that directory. As we are in this file, we need to go into the images directory and then we can locate or use the image inside that directory. So let's save this and take a look in the browser just to make sure things are displaying properly. As you can see, we still have the image of the guinea pig displayed in our browser. I hope you've learned a little bit about rendering images in HTML using the image element, using relative file paths, using the width and height attributes, and also the alternate text attribute of the image element. In HTML, it sometimes makes sense to render some data inside a table. So let's have a look at creating the table element, which is denoted by the opening and closing table tags. This is actually a semantic element. As you can tell by the name of the element, table, we have a rough idea on what's actually going to be inside that element, i.e. it is going to be a table. So inside a table, we have things called table rows, denoted by the opening and closing TR tags. We also have things called table headings. These are denoted by the opening and closing th tags. We also have the opening and closing td tags defining tabular data. So let's create a table of three by three. So we're gonna have three rows and three columns. Let's just make that third row now. Creating our table row and defining our tabular data. So now we have three rows. 
So let's create our other two columns. Each column is going to have a table heading. Then each subsequent row needs tabular data for that specific table heading. So this might look a little bit confusing right now. So what we can actually do is break this up so it's easily readable. So we can clearly see where our table rows are and what's actually inside our table rows. Just like that. So our first table heading is going to be color. Our second table heading will be width. And our last table heading will be height. I'm just going to fill this in. So we're going to have green and 100 and 100 and blue and 75 by 85. Right. So this is essentially a table. In HTML5, we also have the caption. This is defined with the caption opening and closing tags. And here we can put some descriptive text or a caption of our table. So this will display above the table and it's a good idea to get into the habit of actually using the caption. So let's save this and take a look in our browser. As you can see, we have some kind of table. It's a bit squashed up. So let's add some borders to our table, our table cells. We can do this by using the border attribute of the table element. We could either leave it like this to specify no borders, or we can put in a value of one to specify borders. So let's set it to one. Let's go ahead and save this and take a look in the browser and see what this looks like now. As you can see, we now have some borders surrounding our table cells and our table element. It is a little bit easier to read. I hope you've learned a little bit about the table element in HTML5, along with the caption element, table rows, table headings, and tabular data. In this video, we're going to start to take a look at forms in HTML5. Create a form using the form element, denoted by the opening and closing form tags. Inside the form, we have things called inputs, and these inputs have a type. The most common input type is text, which will allow the user to essentially just enter in some text. Close an input just like that in HTML5. We also have an input of type password that is very common. And as you can guess, the user can then enter in a password. We also have an input of type submit. And this is important as it renders a button and allows the user to click on the button to submit the form. We also need to pass in a couple of attributes to the opening form tag. One of these attributes is the action, and the value that we put into the action attribute is where the form will actually be sent to. So that will be generally dealt with with some server-side processing. As this is not a server-side processing video, we're going to go ahead and leave the action attribute blank. But please note that this will show an error in the online validator by leaving the action attribute blank. But for the purpose of this video, we're going to go ahead and leave it blank. We also have a method. The method attribute will take a value of either post or get. For the purpose of this video, we're going to take a look at using the get method and forming a query string. We'll take a look at the query string in just a moment. 
it's very important to remember that we would never use the get method to submit any type of sensitive data. To form the actual query string, we need to pass in a name attribute. And for this input, I'm just going to type in username as the name. And for this one, I'm going to type in password. So let's go ahead and save this and take a look in the browser. As you can see, we have some form of bare form. This would be the input of type text. This would be the input of type password. And this is our input of type submit. You can see this button. By default, the word submit will be printed on this button. But we can change that and we'll have a look at that in just a moment. So I'm just going to enter in some information. I'm just going to use my name and a password of password and click submit. As you can see, we have some data appended to our URL in the address bar. This is a query string. It starts with the question mark. So username refers to the name attribute I've given to the first input and the value of that is what I've typed into the input. And an ampersand and then the password, which is actually the name attribute as specified for this second field, which is a password field. And the value for that, I've entered in password. So as you can see, when I enter in text into the password field, it actually renders as little dots. It's important to remember that this is only a masking mechanism. As you can see, the password has been submitted in plain text. So let's take a look at adding some extra things to this form. We'll start off by changing the text rendered on the submit button. We use this with the value attribute. Submit the form will now be rendered on that button rather than the standard default of submit. Just take a quick look at this in the browser. And now we have submit the form rendered on the button. Right, so now let's take a look at field sets. A field set is used to group related inputs. It's denoted by the opening and closing field set tags. I'm just going to cut this closing field set tag and put it down the bottom just before our closing form tag. Then indent our inputs as per good coding practice. So now that we have a field set we can actually add in a legend which is denoted by the opening and closing legend tags. And here we can enter in some text that will be rendered above the form as a type of caption. Let's go ahead and save this. Just take a look in the browser and see what this actually looks like now. As you can see, we now have some kind of border surrounding our form and a caption that's kind of embedded in this border. So now let's make our form a little bit nicer by adding in some labels. Labels are denoted by the opening and closing label tag and the label takes a for attribute and this for attribute must match an ID of the input that we are using the label for. This will make more sense in just a moment. So for the for attribute of this label I'm going to type in username then I'm going to add an ID to this input of username. So this label will be for the input with an ID of username. Then we can enter in some text in between the opening and closing label tags. I'm going to go ahead and do the same for the password.
using the for attribute, then making sure we add an ID of password to match the for attribute of that label. So essentially what a label will do is we can click on the label and focus will be brought to the input that the label is for. So let's save this and take a look in the browser. As you can see, we now have some text just before our inputs. So if I go ahead and click on username, focus will be brought to that text field and same for password. So now as of HTML5, we can actually use a placeholder attribute as well. And this is actually quite nice. Looks just like that. We can enter in some text into the placeholder that will be rendered in that input by default. It may help a user understand what that input is actually for. So I'm just going to go ahead and enter in username. Go ahead and do the same for the password. We're typing in password. So let's save this. Take a look in the browser and see how this looks. As you can see, we have some kind of grayed out text in the actual input. It's actually quite a nice feature of HTML5. When we click on that, we can now enter in our data and submit the form and just as we had before we have our query string so this is just adding some nice features to our form without affecting the actual functionality of the form we also have an input of type reset as you may have guessed this will allow us or the user to click on this button and it will actually clear the form inputs. You can also pass in a value here to change the default text which would just be reset. We can do clear the form. Let's save this. Take another look in the browser. As you can see we now have an extra button. Let's try this out. Clear the form and the form has been cleared. So I hope you've learned a little bit about using forms in HTML5, the field set, legend, basic input types and labels. In this video we're going to take a look at setting values for our input types or our input fields. Let's start off by creating our form with the action attribute and the method which will be get. Our field set and our legend. Right. So now we'll create an input of just type text and we'll give that a name and we'll give that a name of username and close it just like that. As you may know we can pass in a placeholder so we'll have some grayed out text rendered in the input by default when the page loads. So let's just take a look at what the placeholder does and how it looks in the input. And I'll put a input of type submit and we'll just leave the standard default submit text rendered on the button. So we'll go ahead and save this and check it out in the browser. As you can see we have some grayed out text displayed in the input. So if I click submit there's actually no data inside that input field. There's only a placeholder. So as you can see when I click submit username equals nothing. It's just empty. So let's check out what happens if we change this to a value. Save this and take another look in the browser. 
now we actually have some text that we can actually highlight and edit in this text field. So now what happens when I click submit is the actual text that is in there, i.e. the value of that text input, is now actually submitted. So that's basically the difference between the value and the placeholder attribute of forms. So I hope you've learned a little bit about the difference between the placeholder attribute and the value attribute in HTML. In this video we're going to talk about radio buttons, checkboxes, the select element and text areas. So to start off let's create our form element and add in our action which we'll just leave blank and the method which we'll be using get now let's create some radio buttons. These are inputs of type radio. And the name I'm just going to put on off. Also give this a value of on. And another radio button, an input of type radio. And the name of this will be the same as the previous radio button. And the value will be off. So you may be wondering why these two radio buttons have the actual same name attribute set on off. With radio buttons, essentially what they do is they allow a user to select one option from a predefined number of options. So in this case we're creating two radio buttons and therefore the user can select one of these options and only one at a time. So by using the same name value for both radio inputs, we're basically creating a form of a radio button group. So let's add in some labels so we can see which radio button is which in the browser. So I'm going to put a label for on and an ID to match the labels for attribute. Then one more label for our off radio button. and an ID yet again to match the labels for attribute. Right, so let's not forget to put in our input of type submit. And it's gonna change the value of submit the form. And close it just like that. So let's take a look at radio buttons in the browser, saving it and opening up the browser. So as you can see, we have our on button and an off button. So I can go ahead and select this on button, but if I go ahead and select the off button, the on button will be automatically deselected. So like I was saying, in this group that we have, i.e. radio buttons with the same name attribute, the user can select one from a group of predefined options. So you cannot select both at the same time. So let's select on and click submit the form and as you can see the query string says on off which is the name attribute for these radio buttons equals on and if we select off we'll get on off equals off in the query string. So now let's take a look at some checkboxes. Checkboxes are an input of type checkbox. And then we pass in a name, I'm just going to put Twitter, then a value of yes. Let's create another input of type checkbox and set the name to Facebook. And the value to yes. Right, so I'm just going to add some labels <clears throat> so we can see which checkbox is which in the browser. An ID to match that labels for attribute. And one last label.
with an ID to match the labels for attribute. Right, so let's go ahead and save this and check out checkboxes in the browser. As you can see, I can select both checkboxes or I can select one or the other or none of them. So these are quite different to the radio buttons which are essentially in some form of group as they have the same name attribute set. With checkboxes, they work like this. We can select or deselect them at our leisure. So let's go ahead and select on and Twitter and Facebook and submit the form. See on off equals on, that was our radio button, and Twitter equals yes and Facebook equals yes. So that's essentially how radio buttons work and how checkboxes work as well. So now let's check out the select element. The select element essentially displays a little kind of drop down list where the user can select some predefined options. So we use this with the select opening and closing tags. We pass in a name to the opening select tag. I'm just going to call this country. Then inside our select element, we have options, just like that. And these options have values. So for the first one, I'm just going to give it a value of US and enter in US here. So this will be displayed on our little list item. And an option with a value of AUS for Australia. And one more for the UK. Right, so let's go ahead and save this and check this out in the browser. So as you can see, we have some little clickable drop down list. So we can click on it and we'll have a little list drop down and we can make selections. So this time let's select off and just select Facebook and we'll set this to Australia. Click submit the form. As you can see, we have our radio buttons value our checkboxes value and our select elements value is equal to the options value that I had selected. So these are each options and they each have their values. So that's essentially how the select element works in HTML. So let's take a look at the text area element. Text area, opening and closing tags, and we can pass in a name attribute here as well. It's going to put in message. So let's save this and have a look at what the text area renders in the browser. As you can see, we have some form of text area where the user can enter in a message or some form of data. Let's try this out. This time we'll select on, we'll select Twitter and Facebook, and we'll select the UK and type in a message. Click submit the form. As we can see, we have our radio buttons value. Twitter equals yes and Facebook equals yes for our checkboxes. The country equals UK, which was our select element. And message, which is the name attribute of this text area, equals the content that I've actually typed into that text area. This is a message. So I hope you've learned a little bit about radio buttons, checkboxes, the select element, and the text area in HTML. In this video, we're going to take a look at some of the new HTML5 inputs. So let's start off by creating our form and passing in the action, which we'll just leave blank, and the method, and we'll be using get, and our field set, and then our legend. Right, so now let's start off with looking at the email input type. Input type equals email. And we'll give this a name of email. And we'll add in our submit button, an input of type submit. We'll change the text on this button to submit the form and close that just like that. Let's save this and take a look in the browser 
As you can see, we just have some form of text input. This is actually an email input. So I can go ahead and just type in my name and click submit the form. And we get this little pop-up saying, please include the at in the email address as it was missing. So if I enter in the at symbol and click submit the form, we're now prompted to enter in the part following the at symbol. So I'll just type in example, submit the form, and the form's actually been submitted. Even though I didn't enter in any .com or .net after the actual email address. So that's one fault of the email input type. And it's not 100% foolproof. As we can see, we're able to submit an invalid email address. So let's take a look at the tell input. This is an input for telephone numbers. Type equals tell. And name, we're just going to give this a name of phone and close it just like that. Let's save this and take a look what it looks like in the browser. And again, it's just a simple input field, but it's designed to actually enter in numbers. So now let's take a look at the date input type. This is actually quite cool. Input type equals date. And we'll give this a name of date. Close it. We'll save it and check it out in the browser. As you can see, we have some form of date input. We can click on this little down arrow and we'll be popped up with a little calendar. It's actually really, really cool. We can select a date. It'll be entered in to the date input. We can cancel this to clear it, or we could set this manually, setting the date, month, and year. So what if we want the user to be restricted in the actual date or time range that they could enter in? So say if we want them to enter in a date in the future and are not and not a date before today, we can actually do that using the min attribute. The min attribute just looks like this. Min equals, then we need to remember the format that the actual date input is in. The year goes first, so we'll say 2013, hyphen the month, then hyphen the day. So we'll go 01. Let's save this and check it out in the browser and see what happens. So now, if I go and select a date before today, I actually can't go back any further. They're all grayed out. I cannot actually do that. All I can do is enter in or select today's date or any date in the future. So that's quite handy. It's important to note that this may render quite differently in different browsers, but this is just how it looks essentially in Google's Chrome. Let's go ahead and type in some data. Type in ashley at example.com and a phone number of 333-333-333 and we'll select today's date. Click submit the form. As we can see, our form has been submitted. And the format of the date or the value of the date is the year hyphen month hyphen day. So now let's take a look at another kind of input. This is an input of type range, and this is very cool. So we'll have a line break just to separate it, then an input of type range. And our input of type range takes a min and a max attribute. We're also going to pass in a name. We're just going to call it scale. So this could be something of a scale of, say, 1 to 10. So let's take a look at how this renders in the browser. As you can see, we have some kind of slider or scale here, running from 0 all the way to 10. So I'm just going to enter in some details again and select today's date. And I'll set this all the way up to 10 submit the form and then we should have scale equals 10. So 
So that's a very cool input type of HTML5. And just to recap what I was saying before, when I enter in Ashley at example, a clearly invalid email address, yet the form still allows us to submit it. This is proof that we should never rely solely on client-side technologies alone to validate any form of user input. And client-side technologies include technologies like HTML and other client-side technologies which are actually interpreted or rendered in the browser on the client side as opposed to the server side which will be running on the server. So HTML is a client side technology so we should never rely solely on it to validate any form of user input. So now let's take a look at the number input. So input of type number and we'll give this a name of number. Save it and check it out in the browser and see what this input type of number looks like. As you can see, we have an input and we have these little controls with little down and up arrows. And I can change the number by going up or I can change the number by going down. I can also just enter in a number. So what if we want the user to not be able to go lower than the number zero and say not go higher than the number five. Well we use the min and max attributes. So we'll put in a minimum number of zero is allowed and a maximum number of five is allowed. So let's take a look in the browser by saving it and preview it in the browser. So now if I try and go lower than zero I actually can't. If I try and go higher than five I can't do that either. So let's just fill in some information and select today's date and I'll put this down to 1 and I'll set this at 3. So go submit the form and at the end of the query string see number equals 3 the number that I'd selected from this number input. So I hope you've learned a little bit about the new HTML5 form inputs, including the email, tell, date, number and range input types, as well as the min and max attributes. In this video, we're going to take a look at some of the new HTML5 form input attributes. So let's start off with our form, our action, which we'll leave blank, and our method, we'll be using get, our field set and our legend All right so let's just start off with a simple text input give this a name of username All right so what happens when we want the user to load up the page and have their cursor already flashing in a specified input? So that's actually quite handy when someone loads the page and focus is already being brought to that input on page load. So they can just start typing as soon as the page is loaded. We can do that with the auto focus attribute. And in HTML5, it looks just like that. So let's load this in the browser by saving it and previewing it. And as you can see on page load, my cursor is already flashing in this input and I could already start typing. So that's quite a handy feature. So what if we actually require a user to actually fill in a certain input? We can do that by using the required attribute just like that. So let's go ahead and add in our input of type submit so we can test out this required attribute. We can go ahead and save this and take a look in the browser. As you can see our input field still has the auto focus attribute working nicely. So if I go ahead and click submit, I actually get this little pop-up saying please fill out this field. So I can go ahead and type in anything 
and the form will be submitted. So let's now take a look at the checked attribute. We can use this with either radio buttons or checkboxes. So let's try out some radio buttons first. Input type equals radio. Give this a name of on off and give it a value of on. And another radio button. Input type equals radio, name equals on off, and value equals off. And add in some checkboxes. Input type equals checkbox, name equals checkbox one, and the value is yes, we'll say. And one more checkbox. Type equals checkbox. Give this a name of checkbox2. And a value of, say no. So now we have some radio buttons and checkboxes. I'm actually going to go ahead and add in some labels. So we can actually see which form input types are which. Add in an ID, always to match the labels for attribute. And again, an ID to match the labels for attribute. Just a few more labels. And for our checkboxes, and ID to match the labels for attribute, and one last label. So now we can go ahead and specify the checked attribute. So I'm going to set this off radio button to checked. And also, let's set both of these checkboxes to checked. So let's save this and take a look at what the checked attribute does for radio buttons and checkboxes. As you can see, both checkboxes are checked by default. And the off radio button is also checked by default, as specified in the file, in the HTML file. So if you're not familiar with the input type of email and how it actually works in the browser, let's go ahead and create this email input type. Input type equals email. We'll give it a name of email and close it just like that. Also add in a label so we can actually see that this is for the email input. And an ID to match the labels for attribute as always. Go ahead and save this and check it out in the browser. So like I was saying, if you are not familiar with the email input type, it is kind of asking for a valid email address, but I could type in something like this, Ashley at example, which is a completely invalid email address, and it will still be submitted. I'll show you what I mean. I'll just enter in some text here as this field is required. So as you can see, I'm able to submit a completely invalid email address. So it's not very helpful. So let's go ahead and change this. One option to change this is actually use an input type of text and using a pattern attribute. 
The reason for changing the input type to text is that Google's Chrome supports both the pattern attribute and the input type of email, so there'll be a little bit of conflict if we tried to use both. So let's take a look at the pattern attribute and how that works. Basically, we have some opening and closing square brackets, and in there we can pass in the type of letters or numbers that we will allow. So in here I'm going to type in a lowercase a hyphen lowercase z, uppercase a hyphen uppercase z. That's essentially saying we will allow lowercase and uppercase letters. Then what we do inside some curly braces is we can specify the minimum and maximum values or one single static value. So let's say we want a minimum of three and we're not going to specify a maximum, we're just going to have a minimum. So this could be any length that the user enters as long as it's longer than three. And then we want an at symbol, then we want to open our square brackets again and type in A hyphen Z, capital A hyphen capital Z. And then what we want is a minimum of three of them and then we want a dot. So we'll put the dot inside the square brackets. And then again, we will pass in the amount that we will allow. And here we'll pass in a static value, i.e. just one singular value. And this will be one. We only want one full stop there. Then we open and close our square brackets again and pass in A to Z capital A to capital Z and then the number that we will allow. We'll allow a minimum of two with no maximum specified as there are some domain names like .me that have only two letters and you know we don't want to cause any problem for those users. So let's go ahead and save this and check out this pattern attribute. So let's just enter in some data and for the email address I'm now going to select an invalid email address and see how this works. And as you can see we have this please match the requested format pop-up show up on the browser and our form has not been submitted. So what happens if I put the .com? This is now a valid email address. Clicking submit that now submits the form. So as you can see when I type in an invalid email address and click submit this pop-up isn't very helpful. The end user will most likely never know what the requested format is. So we can help the user out by passing in a title attribute. This looks just like this. There are other cases where you use a title attribute for example in hyperlinks and when the user hovers over a hyperlink, if you have the title attribute specified, the text inside the title attribute will actually show up in a little yellow balloon. And it may explain to the user why they should click on a link and kind of where the link will go. A little bit of extra information is always helpful to the end user. So for the title, I'm just going to type in, please enter in a valid email address. And we could also give an example, say example at example.com. Let's save this and see what happens when I type in an invalid email address this time. Let's enter in some data as this field is being required. So let's enter in Ashley at example and see what happens when I click submit. Please match the requested format. Please enter in a valid email address. Example at example.com. So that's very helpful to the user and it lets them know what they've done wrong and why the form hasn't actually been submitted or gone through. So let's take a look at using the pattern attribute with the tell input type. So input type equals tell. Name, I'm just going to call this phone. And close it just like that. And we'll add in our label. call it phone
am ID of phone to match the labels for attribute. Right, so let's add in the pattern attribute. We do this just as we did before. So pattern equals opening closing quotes. So to allow numbers, we can simply do this. Open and close our square brackets and put in a 0 hyphen 9. That will accept any number in between 0 and 9. So pretty much all numbers. Then we pass in the amount of that type of input that we will allow. Let's say we want four of them, followed by a space, and then we want some more numbers. We actually want three of them, a space, and then some more numbers. And we want three of them. So let's go ahead and also add in our title attribute. Please enter in a number in this format. So something like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three. Let's save this and check it out in the browser. So let's just get our information entered in correctly. And for the phone number, if I just type in a random bunch of numbers with no spaces and not adhering to our pattern, clicking submit, we get this pop-up saying, please match the requested format. Please enter in a number in this format. So that's actually quite helpful. So let's try it out with the correct format. Clicking submit and the form has been submitted. So that's how we can use the pattern attribute in HTML to kind of provide some form of guidance and disallow some form of input. But you should never rely solely on client-side technologies to validate any form of user input. And I'll give you a great example of this right now. So if I right-click on this username field, clicking Inspect Element, we can see our HTML inside the Elements panel. And here we can see Autofocus and the required attribute. I can go ahead and just simply double-click on the required attribute, press Delete and Enter, and that field is no longer required. So I can click Submit now, and the form will go through. And the same with our email. I can go in and change the allowed pattern, or I could simply go in and change the entire pattern by deleting it, just like that. I'll delete the required attribute again. And as you can see, the end user can actually manipulate the form. So it's never a good idea to rely solely on client-side technologies to validate any form of user input. So I hope you've learned a little bit about using the pattern attribute, autofocus, the required attribute, and checked for radio buttons and checkboxes, and also the title attribute. In this video, we're going to take a look at adding in a relative URL or file path into the action attribute of our form element. So let's open and close our form, add in our field set, add in our legend, and I'm just going to type in action attribute. Then I'm going to add in just one input of type text going to give it a name of username, close it like that, and have our input of type submit. And we'll just leave the default text on that button. So now let's put in our action and our method. And our method, we will be using get. So now I'm going to go ahead and create a new HTML file inside this HTML directory by right-clicking, going down to New File, and we'll name this destination.html. We're just going to create our basic HTML5 document structure for this destination.html. Not 
not forgetting our character set, UTF-8, and our title, we'll just call this destination, and our body. Whoop. And here I'm just going to type in some text inside a paragraph. This is the destination. Right, so now I'm going to go ahead and save this and head over back to our forms.html file. And now we can add in the destination.html file as a relative file path or URL. As it's in the same directory, this HTML directory, we can just refer to it by using its name. So destination.html. So now let's load this up in the browser by saving it and going to preview and take a look at what happens once we've specified the action attribute to a actual HTML file rather than leaving it blank. So we're on forms.html I'm just going to enter in some arbitrary data just type in a few A's click submit as you can see we've been sent to destination.html and the query string has been formed with the username being the name attribute of the text field and AAAA being the value that I've entered into that text field. So this is our destination.html file. Now to actually have a valid HTML form, we actually need to put in a destination per se for our action attribute. If we leave this blank, this would actually show an error in the validator. But by putting in the actual value for the action attribute, we actually have a valid HTML form. So I hope you've learned a little bit about using the action attribute and sending data to a different HTML file. In this video, we're going to take a look at the fundamental differences between using the get and post methods. So let's start out by creating our form using our field set, our legend, post versus get. And we'll add in one singular input type of type text and give it a name of username and our input of type submit. And we'll leave the default text on that button. Now, for our action, as you may see, I've created a destination.html file, which is just a plain old HTML5 document structure with a paragraph element saying this is the destination.html file. So we're actually going to be sending this data per se to the destination.html file. Destination.html inside the action attribute as it's in the same folder, this HTML directory. So we're going to use our method. We're going to have a quick review of the get method and so we're going to save this and try it out in the browser. As you can see we just have our forms.html in the URL bar. It's going to enter in some arbitrary data clicking submit and you can see we're sent to destination.html as specified an action attribute and we have a query string. This username is the name attribute of the input and the value that I had entered into that input. So that's basically what the get method does. And as you can see, it isn't very secure as the contents of that form has actually been appended to the URL in the form of a query string. So 99% of the time, you would not use the get method. You would use the post method. So we'll take a look at using the post method. As this is not a server-side processing video, we won't get right into what we'd actually do with the data once it's been sent via post, but I'll show you one of the fundamental differences. So let's save this and open it up in the browser. So let's type in some arbitrary data, click submit, and we're sent to destination.html. And notice we do not have a query string appended to the URL. So 99% of the time, we would use the post method. So that's one of the fundamental differences between get and post. Post does not have a query string or does not form a query string.
so you can see where this would be useful. I hope you've learned a little bit about the fundamental differences between the GET and POST methods and that we would never use the GET method to submit or have the user submit any form of sensitive information. In this video we're going to take a look at using an image instead of the normal button that will be rendered for our input of type submit. So in other words we're going to be using an input of type image. So let's create our form, our field set, our legend, call this image as submit button and in here we'll just add an input of type text and call this username, a name of username and close it like that. Now for the input I'm going to put type equals image and now we need to put in a source attribute that source attribute will be a relative or an absolute file path or URL. As you can see, I've got an images folder. If I open this up, I've got a button.png file. So we need to navigate this directory structure by going into the images directory, forward slash, then referencing the actual image's name. So in this case, button.png. So we're going into the images directory and then using the button.png file. Now, as you may know, when we work with images, sometimes they may not be displayed, i.e. we could have an incorrect URL, or for many other reasons. So we need to pass in the alternate text attribute. For this, I'm just going to put submit. So in the case that our button cannot be rendered, we will still have some text saying submit. So I'm going to go ahead and specify our action and method attributes of the opening form tag and method will be get and action I'm going to put destination dot html now I'm going to go ahead and create this destination dot html file going right clicking on a html directory selecting new file and typing in our final name destination dot html and in here we're going to create our basic html5 document structure doc type HTML, our opening and closing HTML tags, opening and closing head tags, our meta tag for our character set, our char set, our character set equals UTF-8, and our title, we're going to put in destination, then our body, and then I'm just going to enter in some text saying this is the destination.html file. Go ahead and save this and head back over to our forms.html file. So now we've got our action attribute specified and our method attribute specified as well. So this is now a valid form in HTML. And we're also using the input of type image instead of using the ordinary input type of submit for our submit button. So let's go ahead and save this and check out this input type of image in the browser. So as you can see we have an image rather than our normal submit button. I'm just going to go ahead and enter in some arbitrary data and click the big button. As you can see we've successfully been sent to destination.html and we also have our query string. We may also notice we have this x equals 45 and y equals 29. These are mouse coordinates for where we've actually clicked on the button. So if we go ahead and click the back button and click the button down here, per se, we'll see that these have actually changed in value. So I hope you've learned a little bit about using the input of type image rather than using the general input type of submit for a submit button on your form. In this video, we're going to create an international hotel booking form. So we're going to start out with our form, our action, which we'll just leave blank, and our method, which we'll pass in get. Then we have our field set and our legend. And we're actually going to have two different field sets. So for this field set, I'm going to say personal details. 
inside the legend. Then we're going to create some inputs. We're going to start off with an input of type text. We're going to give this a name of username. We're also going to pass in an ID of name. And we're going to pass in required as we want this field to be filled out and autofocus so the user can start typing as soon as the page is loaded and we'll put in a placeholder and here we'll just enter in your username and we'll have a pattern and for the pattern what we want to do is allow any amount of letters as long as it's greater than three whether that be uppercase or lowercase so we'll do A hyphen Z in lowercase, then capital A hyphen capital Z, and then we will allow a minimum of three, just like that. Also want to pass in the title, so we can give the user a helpful hint if they enter in any information that does not match this pattern. So there is our username input. Let's give this a label. And as you may have noticed, I've already given this input a ID. So we can just say for name and just put username. Right, so that input is all set up and ready to go. Now what we wanna do is we wanna have an input field of type text. We we'll actually be using this to enter in emails, but we want to use the pattern to prevent any invalid email addresses. So we type equals text, we'll give this a name of email. Then we'll give it an ID of email as well for a label that we'll create in a second. And we also want this one required. And we'll give this a placeholder of your email and then we'll pass in a pattern so we want to allow lowercase and uppercase letters starting with a minimum of three then we want the at symbol then we want some more letters a to z lowercase and uppercase and we want a minimum of three of them as well. And then we want a full stop. And we just want one of them, so we just enter in a static value, i.e. just one value. So there has to be one full stop right there. Then we'll enter in some more letters. So lowercase a to lowercase z, uppercase a to uppercase z. And we want a minimum of two. Also pass in a title here as well. Please enter in a valid email address. So now we can go ahead and add the label for this input for email as we've already created the ID of email for this input. Right, so now we want a phone input so the user can enter in their phone number when making a booking. So we'll start off with an input of type tell and a name of phone and an ID of phone as well. Also want this field to be required and the placeholder will be please enter in your phone number and the pattern for this one will be something like this so we want to allow numbers from 0 to 9 we want to allow 4 of them no more no less followed by a space the numbers 0 to 9 we want 3 of them no more, no less, a space, some more numbers, zero to nine, and exactly three of them as well. 
So now let's pass in the title. Please enter in a phone number in this format. And we'll add our label. For phone and putting phone. Now we're going to add a select element so the user can actually select their country. So we just add in our select element just like this, pass in a name attribute and give that a value of country. And I'm also going to pass in the required attribute because we require them to actually select a country. So required. Then we'll pass in our options. And what I'm going to do for this first option, I'm going to leave the value blank. So by default, there'll be a blank option selected. Now to make this valid HTML, we can leave this value attribute blank, but we must also put in a blank space here. This will allow us to validate our form and have it validate successfully. So then the other options, I'm just going to put in some countries. The first one, I'm going to put in US and put US. This text doesn't have to actually match this value attributes value in there. Put in one for the UK. And one more for Australia. AUS. Right. So now we have our select element complete, we actually have our first section of this form completed. Our field set is complete. So now we can go ahead and put in a line break just to separate this first section from this next section. And we're going to put in our second field set. As field sets are used to group related inputs. So these are related as they are relating to personal details. And these will be related because they'll be related to booking details. So for the legend, I'm going to put booking details. Then we can add in some more inputs. So we're going to start off with an input of type date. We're going to give this a name of date. And we're also going to pass in a minimum value because we don't want the user to book a date in the past. That wouldn't really make sense. So remembering the actual format for the date as it is submitted, we use the year, hyphen the month, hyphen the day. So in this case, I'm going to say a minimum value of today's date. So that'll be 2013 hyphen 12 hyphen 02. Then I'm going to close the date input just like that. Now we're going to put in an input of type number, give this a name of number of guests. Then we're going to say we can have a minimum of one guest and an absolute maximum of six guests booking for the same hotel room, I assume. And close it just like that. Now we're actually going to have a paragraph and we're going to say, do you require meals? And under here, we're going to have some radio buttons. So an input of type radio. We're going to give this a name of meals and a value of yes meals. And a second input of type radio. Give this a name matching the previous radio button as to form some kind of radio button group and give this a value of no mills. So now I want to put in a line break to separate this next input and this next input is going to be of type checkbox. And it's going to have a name of balcony basically asking whether the user would like a balcony for their hotel room. And we're going to put in the value of yes. 
and by default we're going to say checked. So now that we have our second field set complete, I'm going to go ahead and add in a button. So I've added in this images directory inside our HTML directory and we're going to use this button instead of the standard or default submit button. So I'm actually going to put an input of type image right under here under a line break and put our input of type image right here. So input type image source attribute we've got to navigate to the images directory we can do that by just saying images forward slash and then the actual file name which is just button.png and close it just like that. So go ahead and save this and take a quick look in the browser. As you can see we have some kind of form. We have our first field set and our second field set. But before we try and submit this and validate it using the online validator I'm just going to add in some labels so we can actually see what is what. So we'll start off by adding a label for our date input for Call this date, booking date, and give this an ID as always to match the labels for attribute, so date, and give this one a label for equals, we'll call this number of guests, and number of guests and an ID to match that labels for attribute number of guests. Now we'll add some labels for our radio buttons. Call this yes meals and yes. Then our ID of yes meals. Another label for our second radio button. Call this no meals and no. Then an ID of no meals. And finally a label for our checkbox. We'll call this one balcony. Do you require a balcony? And an ID to match the labels for attribute. Balcony. Right. Just to recap what our form is actually doing at the moment, we have our first field set which contains personal details. So this first field set is containing related input fields, details about the person or the user, and the second field set is containing input fields that relate to the person or the user's booking details. So that's how we use field sets to group related input fields. So now we're going to add in an action. We're going to call this destination.html. Now we're going to create that HTML file. So right click on the HTML directory, selecting new file, and typing in the file name. Destination.html. Put a T in there. Now we're going to head and double click this to open it in the text editor. Type out our basic HTML5 document structure, our head, and our meta tag for the character set or the char set, UTF-8, our title, just calling this destination, and our body. In the body I'm actually going to use a level 2 heading and say this is the destination form, sorry, destination.html file I should say. Right, so I'm going to go ahead and save this. And save this now that we've got our action and our method set up. And we are using an image instead of our general submit button. We actually should be passing in an alternate text attribute. So if the image cannot be rendered for whatever reason, including the image not being found at that relative URL, we should pass in text so that would be rendered as a kind of fallback solution. So now that we've entered in our alternate text, 
Let's go ahead and save this and check it out in the browser and have a go at submitting our form. So I'm going to go ahead and just click submit without entering in any details. Please enter in more than three letters. So that's our patent attribute doing that for us. And now we're prompted to enter in a valid email address. So I'm going to put example at example.com and submit. And now we're prompted to enter in a valid phone number in the form of four numbers, space three numbers, space three numbers. As you can see, our select element is actually displaying a blank value. So if we click submit, please select an item in the list. So I'm going to go ahead and select Australia. Now we can go ahead and select the booking date. We can't actually go back in time. We can only go into the future or select today's date. So I'm going to select today's date. And we're only allowing one to six. So we can only select a number between one and six for the number of guests. So let's select three of them. Do you require meals? We can either select yes or we can either select no. We cannot select both of them at the same time. So that makes sense. I'm going to say yes. And do you require a balcony? I'm going to go ahead and uncheck that. So clicking on our button, we can see that our form has been sent to the destination.html file. And we have our query string containing all of the data that we've entered into the form including our mouse coordinates for the image where we've clicked on the actual submit image. Right, so let's head on over to validator.w3.org and let's validate this file. So go to forms, open and click check. This document was successfully checked as HTML5, passed with two warnings. Let's check out these warnings. As you may already know, we'll always get the using experimental feature HTML5 conformance checker warning, while HTML5 is not set in stone. So we have this other warning regarding the date input type. The date input type is not supported in all browsers. Please be sure to test and consider using a polyfill. So basically that's letting us know that the input field of type date may not work consistently among browsers and platforms. Hopefully one day soon in the future, this will actually be a recommendation or be fully supported because it's actually a really cool input type and it's very helpful. So there we go. We have a valid form in HTML5. In this video, we're going to take a look at some of the new HTML5 semantic elements. So the word semantics comes from ancient Greek, referring to a study of meaning. So when we say semantic elements, we simply mean elements with meaning, i.e. from the element's name, we have a rough idea on what the element should actually contain. So let's start out by taking a look at the nav element, denoted by the opening and closing nav tags. Now the nav element should contain the main navigational content of a web page, such as links to help the user navigate their way around the website. Then we also have a header element, and the header element should contain introductory text regarding the web page, or introductory content, I should say. We also have a footer element, denoted by the opening and closing footer tags. Inside the footer element, we should put some content such as links to other related documents and copyright information. Copyright information could be regarding the author of the website. Related document links and copyright information. Let's clear that up. Now we also have a section element denoted by the opening and closing section tags. The section element is defined as being a thematic grouping of content. And we should identify what that content is with some form of heading. I'm just going to put HTML 
and then we could have a paragraph of text under that heading saying HTML is a great language to learn and there's some form of section it has a theme and the theme is HTML and we've identified that with our level 3 heading and we also have an article element I'm just going to put it down here now the article element is defined by the opening and closing article tags now the article element is defined as representing a self-contained composition in a document so an example of this would be using the article element as some form of forum post so let's take a look at this we could have our header element inside our header we could have a level 3 heading this is a forum post and under there we could have a paragraph element saying by Ashley then under there we could have our content this is a very very short forum post then under there we could also have our footer element saying written by Ashley right so there's some kind of article representing a forum post it's important to note that the header and footer elements inside the article are in a different kind of context so our header at the top of our document and the footer at the bottom of the document they're headers and footers for the web page as a whole but in the context of having a header and footer inside an article the header inside the article should contain introductory content regarding that article and that footer should contain footer type content regarding that article so they're basically the two different contexts that we can have some of these elements in now that we've had a quick look at some of the new HTML5 semantic elements let's take a look at where you can actually learn more about these semantic elements you can find this at dev.w3.org forward slash html5 forward slash spec and here we can see the specification for HTML5 so I recommend having a read through this although it may be quite a large document it'll give you some really solid understandings of some of the different elements and concepts of HTML in HTML5 we also have a meter element and a progress element so to demonstrate this I've gone ahead and created a new HTML file with our HTML5 document structure and titled it progress.html so let's take a look at the meter element the meter element looks just like this with the opening and closing meter tags the opening meter tag can take quite a few attributes we will just be looking at three of them and these are the min attribute the max attribute and the value attribute so for the minimum I'm going to put 0 for the maximum I'm going to put 100 and for the value I'm going to put in 50 so you can kind of think of this as being at 50 percent you can use the meter element to define a scalar measurement within a known range so the meter tag will also take some fallback text and we pass this in between the opening and closing meter tags so we can just put in something like your browser does not support the meter element so this text your browser does not support the meter element will be displayed in the case that the user's browser does not actually support the HTML5 meter element so let's save this and take a look in the browser as you can see we have quite a nice little gauge or a meter now we can also use a progress element I'm just going to put in a line break to separate these two and the progress element is defined by the opening and closing progress tags and just as the meter element we can also pass in some fallback text your browser does not support the progress element so now we need to pass in some attributes so we'll pass in a value this time we're going to make it at let's say 75 
So a value of 75 at a maximum of 100. So you can think of this as 75%. So we can use the progress element to represent the progress or completion of a task. So let's save this and check out these new elements in the browser. So we have our meter element from before. Now we have this nice looking progress bar, which is at 75%. So it's important to note that the progress element will be displayed slightly differently depending on your platform, including your operating system and your browser. But it's quite a nice way to represent some form of progress. So I hope you've learned a little bit about the meter element and the progress element in HTML. In this video, we're going to take a look at one of the great new features of HTML5. That's actually playing audio directly in the browser without having to use any third-party plugins. So I've obtained this title underscore wave.mp3 file from the YouTube audio library and placed it in the audio directory within our HTML directory. To actually use this, we use the audio tag, opening and closing. Now the opening audio tag, we should add in controls. This will actually allow the user to control the audio, including playing, pausing, and adjusting the volume. So you can see how important this controls attribute is. So inside our audio element, we have a source element, which is actually a self-contained tag. It does not have a specified end or closing tag. And in here, we specify a source using the source attribute. And we also specify a type. So for the source attribute, we can navigate to the audio directory by typing in audio. And then we can reference the file name after a forward slash. So this is title underscore wave dot mp3. Now for the type. This type attribute actually accepts a MIME type. And a MIME type is basically something that allow the browser to know what it's actually receiving, what type of data it is receiving. So the MIME type for .mp3 files is actually audio forward slash MPEG, MPEG. Now we have a audio element that will allow the user to play and pause our song that we've specified. And we've also specified the correct MIME type for .mp3. Now, not all browsers support .mp3 files or the audio forward slash MPEG MIME type. So at the time of this recording, MP3 is currently supported in Internet Explorer, Chrome, and Safari. Now Firefox and Opera take a different file type. So we can do this by just specifying another source. The source attribute will just equal a relative or absolute file path to our OGG file. And the MIME type for OGG is actually just audio forward slash OGG. Now I'm not actually going to go and convert this .mp3 file into a .ogg, but I'm just showing you how you can actually support majority of the major browsers. So we can also specify fallback text. So if the audio element isn't supported in a user's browser, this text will be displayed instead of the audio. So we can just say the audio element is not supported in your browser. Right, so let's save this and take a look in the browser. As we can see, we have our audio element displayed with a play button, the time, volume controls. We can mute that or unmute that or simply manually alter the volume. And let's go ahead and click play. As you can see, we've successfully been able to play some music natively in the browser. So just to recap, I haven't actually created this .ogg version of that music. I'll leave that up to you. And you would do that to support browsers such as Firefox and Opera. 
So I hope you've learned a little bit about the audio element in HTML5. In this video, we're going to take a look at one of the other great features in HTML5, and that is playing a video directly in the browser without the help of any third-party plugins. So as you can see, I've obtained this bigbuckbunny.mp4 file from bigbuckbunny.org, and I've placed it inside a video directory inside our HTML directory. So to actually render a video in the browser, we use the video element, denoted by the opening and closing video tags. Then we pass in a source, and this source doesn't have a closing tag. And then we pass in a source attribute and a type attribute. The source is the relative or absolute file path to the video, in this case inside our video directory. So we can reference this video by typing in the directory name and typing in bigbuckbunny.mp4. Then we need to pass in a MIME type. And a MIME type is basically something that will let the browser know what kind of data or file that it should expect. So for an mp4 video file, we type in video forward slash mp4. At the time of this recording, the MP4 file format is actually supported in Internet Explorer and Chrome and Safari. So Firefox and Opera actually require a different file format. And this file format is OGG. I'm not actually going to convert this bigbuckbunny.mp4 into an OGG file, but I'll show you how we can pass in alternate sources to support different kinds of browsers. So if we did have a bigbuckbunny.ogg file in the same directory, we'd just type it in just like this, .ogg. And the MIME type for an OGG video is actually just video forward slash OGG. So we can also pass in some fallback text that will be rendered in the case that the browser does not actually support the video element. Just like this. And in the opening video tag, we actually need to pass in a width, a height, and an attribute. So we'll start off with the width. For this, we're going to say 640. That's 640 pixels. And the height, we're going to set this to 480 pixels. And we need to pass in the attribute of controls. And it looks just like that. So now let's go ahead and save this and check it out in the browser. As you can see, we have our video displayed in the browser with some controls. We can go ahead and hit play and the video will play. So I hope you've learned something new about the video element in HTML5 using alternate sources and using fallback text.